Good. So welcome everybody. It's 4:30 on Wednesday. I know you guys are kind of getting ready to uh, kick things off. So hopefully everybody's in the right room. We're going to talk about deploying location services and enhanced 911. Um, we're focused on Link Server 2013 specifically. I'm supposed to wait for the door to close. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jason Collier. I'm very quiet, shy, and calm, as you all have noticed. Um, I'm based out of Seattle, so I did have a bit of a nightmare on Saturday when you guys had this big fireball in the sky thing going on. Wasn't so sure about what the sun was. We haven't seen that since October. So, um, IP contributors, so if you guys have seen the cool little workload poster down there, um, I've worked on that. There's a great networking guide out there. Um, that I highly recommend. Um, the link uh, rollout and adoption success kit, RASC, I hope you all have used that. Um, I see a few customers in the room that I've done trainings for. Um, I'm a premier field engineer, so has anybody in here had a PFE on site? Wow, okay, wish more. But um, So we're usually sent out to train, fix, help solve, help solution. So I'm on the after the deployment side and Alan's on the pre-deployment side. Um, so you've got kind of a symbiotic relationship of he deploys it, and I. <laughs> that wasn't recorded, so. <laughs> yeah, OK. And um, I should be clear, somebody modified some of Alan's slides after he um, approved them. So if you catch any of the comments that uh, may be up here, I don't know how that happened. So okay. go ahead, Alan. OK. So. As Jason said, I'm a consultant with MCS, so we're from different sides of the same coin. And he always says that his he, uh, PFEs fix the, the work of MCS, and I always say I do it right, so it never needs fixing. So <laughs> um, I've worked at Microsoft for three years. I'm in the commercial practice on the East Coast, and uh, although I've done a lot of work in the public sector, and that's where I had the misfortune to meet Jason. So. Um, I'm a certified link master, of course. That's, a, that's an extinct qualification now, so it doesn't mean much, but it's the only thing I could put up there. So It's probably age-based. Probably. Um, and I just want to reiterate, this is a 400 session, right? This is not an introduction to E911 and location information services. There is material out there on the web, particularly the Ignite training that's available from Microsoft.com. It's going to provide a good introduction to E911. Um, we're going to provide a very high level overview of E911 and location services, but we're going to quickly get into some depth here. So last chance to leave the room. Yeah, it, it, and Alan said it's going to get deep, and you're going to need a drink afterwards, which is good, right? It's 400 level. I don't think I've ever been to a conference where I could say, wow, that was too technical, and then be upset. Um, so to help that, we're going to kind of tr launch things off with a um, video that kind of puts 911 into perspective. Um, so this is um, approved. So I highly recommend it. It's a good icebreaker. So um, feel free to chuckle along. And when you finish, fill out your session evals. Um, this 911 call raised some eyebrows. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, um, my wife got attacked by a warthog real bad, and I need someone to come up with an ambulance and pick her up. OK, sir, uh, can you give me your address? Uh, yeah, we're at 1825 Eucalyptus Drive. Okay, could you spell that for me, sir? Uh, I, I'm going to drag her on over to Oak Street, and you can pick her up there. <laughs> All right. I can't, I can't pledge that that's a... Uh, yeah, I know. I, they found it. All right, so please fill out your session evaluations and have a great day. Um, so a lot of humor in that, right? But that's exactly what we're going to talk about for the next 75 minutes. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know how to spell eucalyptus. It's funny, Alan chuckles every time I try to get it up here in YouTube. He's like, nope, nope, nope. Um, so, but that is a humorous perspective on a very serious topic. Um, Alan alluded to it. I work public sector. Um, I have a customer that's based in the Puget Sound area of Pacific Northwest, so Seattle, that has jails, hospitals, SWAT, uh, what courts. else? What? Courts, the courts. The courtrooms. 
Do you want to talk about a lot of 911 call volume? Right there. So I never fully grasped the impact of 911 until I knew that my services and my infrastructure were going to be used to save lives. So it's a very interesting concept for us when you start putting this into perspective. So I'll kind of give us the basic background. Um, and what we're going to talk about is a lot of North America specific. Um, so for those of us in the US, we all know 911 is the official number, national emergency number um, for North America. Anyone in here a fan of the IT crowd? You ever see the episode where they come out with the new emergency services number? <laughs> so one day, I asked Alan for help with the regex expression to help translate this new emergency services number. And he's totally oblivious to the fact I'm joking. And he put it all together yeah, just so that go. would respond to 911. It was about a week we didn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. So <laughs> it might have been longer. Yeah, it might have been. <laughs> so thanks for bringing that up again. Yes. So the final destination of a 911 call. So this is me. I'm in the Seattle jail. As a, an employee, as a police officer, he's like, yeah, I know. So I pick up the phone. I call 911. My end goal, the person I want to talk to, is what we call the public safety answering point, or the PSAP. You'll kind of hear that. So PSAP jurisdictions are usually city, county, township based, uh, depends where you're at in the US. Um, what's the problem we have with Link? And don't you answer in the third row. Well, no, no, no. So I'm in my hotel right now. I dial 911. What's my area code? Seattle. That's going to take a long time for them to help me figure out why I can't get the bathroom door open. It just got stuck. It was very frustrating. It was like I almost called Alan, knew he wouldn't help. So um, we have a challenge, right? So phones are portable. I can unplug this common area phone. There's none in this room. And I can go throw it in a different courtroom, which is common, right? A judge says, I want a speakerphone. They go get a speakerphone, right? It's still registered. It's moved floors, it's moved buildings, it's changed locations. So there's, there's a huge amount of challenges that the powerful, powerfulness? That's a good word. Yeah, sure. Sure. The uh, power of Link can introduce. So um, the other things that we'll talk about, I have a customer that has, we're going to talk about how we use subnets and things like that, that has subnets that span multiple floors vertically. And that's a problem where if I have to tell a 911 responder to respond to the first floor of a 35 floor facility, it can be a challenge. So we'll talk about that. So VoIP provides us that highly mobile work environment. I can log in from home. I can log in on my laptop. Anybody got a MiFi or a little portable data wireless card? You're on the bus. You see something happen. You call 911, right? Now there's challenges around that. So. So if you think back to the original legacy PBXs, you know, obviously um, times were a lot simpler back then. And in the US, we tend to think of uh, 911 as being this um, ubiquitous service that's uh, very reliable. And that's true for the most part. You know, there's still a lot of counties out there that don't have enhanced 911 and rely on basic service. In fact, Nevada is probably one of the worst states to, uh, in terms of its uh, support for enhanced 911. So don't get lost once you're outside uh, Clark County here. Um, but in terms of the PBX world, right, um, you know, if you think back to the TDM PBXs, you know, there was a lot of reliance initially on Annie for, you know, automatic number identification. And then, you know, that progressed forward to the, the concept of PS Alley, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And, you know, with the concept of matching a, a, pseudo, uh, a pseudo Annie or a, a real Annie to an to a, uh, emergency response location so that, um, you know, first responders could actually get to the scene of an emergency. And as time developed and we moved to a, a VoIP system, then you know, obviously um, that concept became much more important just because of the, you know, the concepts that Jason just discussed in terms of you know, really user mobility and client mobility. And so um, you know, pseudo-ANI is, is by far the most common implementation. You'll hear it referred to as you know, ELIN, emergency loca location identification number, and the whole concept of, you know, private databases where you can manage, you as an organization can manage your own addresses and can ensure that you know, emergency responders get to 
the correct location if, if there is, in fact, an emergency. So I don't see anybody that was in my last session, so I'm going to use the same joke that I used last time, so I apologize. Um, the big thing I want to stress is, you guys seen this commercial, I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express, so I'm a lawyer now. Um, there are state laws and guidelines that I will not tell you. I know a lot of them for where my customers are, but I can't legally tell you. You need to be aware of these. You need to know what they are. Um, there are some fun ones where you can run into different states have different requirements, different counties have different requirements. You know, 10,000 square foot buildings, 25,000 square foot buildings. So where your locations are, you're going to have to do, unfortunately, your homework, find out what the restrictions are, do I need to get first responders to the front door, to the floor level, things like that. Um, so unique location for different buildings. Obviously, anybody been to the Redmond campuses in Microsoft ever? Kind of small little footprint, right? And you like how we don't put the building numbers in order at all? So you can imagine that's a challenge to a life responder to say, come to building 12. It's next to building 82 and 13. I just, um, I, I'll just jump in if you don't mind. No. One of the things that I really should point out and reiterate, right, is that only 18 states have legislation right now that govern uh, multi-line telephone systems. And the, a lot of that legislation is actually very ineffective. So that's not your primary driver when you're considering E911. It's, it's lawsuits, right? Let's be honest here, right. right? If something goes wrong in an emergency situation, someone gets hurt or someone, you know, worst case scenario, some, someone dies, right? That's, that, that, the reality of, of lawsuits in the U.S. is that it's going to be very expensive for you guys. And that's completely the justification that you need to take away in terms of um, identifying a provider that's going to provide services and ensuring that you know the data that you enter and that you're responsible for managing is is, is completely accurate in, in terms of you know getting someone to the right location. Yeah, and I always say to my customers on the opposite side of the lawsuit, but it's your coworkers, right? If that's you know, if that's Matt or me impersonating Matt dialing 911, I want them to get to the closest location possible. Um, I want them to be able to find me, help me, save me. Um, so. so Link supports E911. Um, we talked about this via SIP trunks and E-Link gateways. Um, everybody's heard about the Open Interoperability Program website in here, right? Everybody at Microsoft's probably preached that repeatedly. This website lists the partners that we've worked with and that we've qualified. Do not deploy a solution that's not from a vendor that's qualified and listed on our site, please. Because that means there's a symbiotic relationship. You want a partner that we know works and that knows how Link works. Um, I'm going to pick on 911 Enable since he's in the third row. They know what's coming in the next releases of Link so that their product can adopt to it. So that's why you want to be with a trusted partner. You know, I thought I saw a Sonus shirt in here. Um, so you want to make sure those partners know what we're going to change, how we're evolving, and that we have that symbiotic relationship. Because really, you don't want to go and say, oh, I can't deploy a new release because my partner can't support it for 18 months. So I'm off the soapbox. Excellent. So this is where we start getting to the interesting stuff. Yeah. So um, we have what's called the location information server. Um, so we have National Emergency Number Association, it's the I2V7 reference. Um, it's, so it's a standard interconnection of VoIP systems. And what we basically say is, here's an interim step in the migration towards end-to-end -to -end IP networks. Now, somebody from a phone provider, if I was in here and said, you know, hey, the PSTN's going to die eventually, would probably lob a brick at me. You know, Microsoft would be happy to tell you that VoIP and IP telephony is going to be just it and everything, you know, I think we'll see that somewhere along yeah, the way. Very much so. One of the standards that we support in, um, or the standard that we support in Link, which is RFC 5139, that's the most recent implementation for uh, PidFlow, is actually a, a core part of, of next generation 911. That's a standard that uh, Nina that you see up there are currently working through in terms of um, ensuring that uh, presence is accurately delivered to a PSAP and in order to allow a first responder to, to get to a location. So this is the future. And certainly, in terms of the rest of the world, there are efforts to standardize with, um, or harmonize with um, the US implementation, simply because the US was, was, was first. And so I'm not speaking on behalf of the product group, but you know, as we see standards implemented in the rest of the world, I would expect to see 
link being able to support those standards um, you know, as we move forward into the future. So while, that, while we're focused on um, E911, E911 in the US, you know, it, it is going to be an international capability at some point in the near future. Yep. And, and I think you know, the way Link does it is an interesting concept where we actually have the addresses, we validate the addresses, and we do all this natively, and then we send it off in that PID flow data to the provider. And I say to, you know, hey, 911 enable, here you go. I've already validated this, trust me, right? And hopefully, well, he's looking at me going, I'm not trusting you, Jason. He's like, I know better than this. <laughs> Somebody give this guy a five. Um, so we'll talk about the location information server. Um, so it's a web services implementation for um, determining your location. Um, you do some standard binging, or if you're those people that use Google, you can find the WSDL URL syntax so you can actually see the web services format. Um, but this is basically what identifies and populates your user location in the client. Um, so what's pretty sexy is I have the Seattle customer, and they have, do you remember how many? Like 11,000 wireless access points all over King County. Oops. <laughs> all over the Seattle area of that county. So all their access points. So I can hop on my laptop, and I can get in the elevator and watch the client change locations. How cool is that? As I go to different access points, I can hop in a tunnel and look on my laptop, and it tells me which tunnel I'm in. That's pretty sexy. So I digress. So obviously, one of the, one of the nice parts of, of Link's implementation of um, inf uh, location information server is that it supports multiple types of network identifiers. And that really provides a lot of flexibility in how you're deploying this. Um, you know, you can, we've got the, li the basic list there. So we support you know, wireless clients, which is the critical part in, in, in terms of wireless connectivity. And obviously, one of the goals of a UC deployment is to you know, enable your employee to be mobile, to be mobile, working remotely from home, to be um, mobile in the workplace. Uh, but aside from that, we also support, you know, the standard subnets, and actually, that's by far the easiest one to implement, I think, yes. right? So, you know, if you have subnets organized in such a fashion that you can, you know, either um, pinpoint a location to a specific area on a floor or a, or a specific floor, once again, that goes back to what's, what, what your responsibilities are in terms of, you know, state legislation. Um, but we also support MAC, um, res, uh, location by MAC address, and, and Jason talked a bit, little bit about that, where we have this concept of, of uh, a subnet that spans a building vertically. So you've got a subnet that covers multiple floors that would be in breach of state legislation in terms of being able to provide an accurate location for an emergency response. And so um, that's when you start considering things like using the MAC of the client that is a nice segue. There so, you go. So um, as Alan mentioned, and, and I didn't accurately portray this, so the subnets for these two courthouses span the first floor to the 12th floor of two separate buildings across the street from each other. So believe it or not, the courtrooms don't have the greatest people in them at times. And them being able to call 911 and say, I'm in the fifth floor courtroom chambers for this courtroom is hugely important. Um, so there may be scenarios where your customers or you don't have great subnet mappings or um, uniqueness. There are vendors out there. Um, this case, you know, we'll pick on 911 enable again. We called them frantically and said, please help. And they have a phone discovery manager that's able to go out and interrogate the switches intelligently and say, hey, let me know which link phone edition devices are connected to this. So it's able to do an interrogative uh, interrogation of those switches, locate these devices, provide that granular level of control that the bailiff wants when he picks up that phone. Because you know, I think anybody went to the raving fans of Link session, users don't care what it, it's a Link phone. They just want to pick it up, dial 911, and have somebody come help. So they don't know we've got all this magic behind the scenes. Um, so locations <coughs> managed in the Liz database, um, I have one. Is this the right slide for the trivia question? Can we no. throw it now? Sure. So anybody set up 911 yet? Perhaps Anyone not, not with Microsoft? Perhaps it's not a good trivia question. OK. Um, Liz, where's the location information services, subnets, and ports, and all of that stored? Who said it? 
It's in the CMS. So we have a Liz database. Totally confuses everybody. That's fair. That's fair. But I gave my one Skype card away. So here. <laughs> you want to fight over it? Go ahead. <laughs> so we import subnets into the Liz database, which really gets people thinking, oh, it's in the Liz database. How do I put it on the other pools? How do I make it site aware? How do I make sure it's highly available? And Matthew nailed it from the University of Iowa. Iowa. I thought it was Nevada after he bagged on Nevada. So. Um, <laughs> Um, it gets imported into the CMS, so that data is part of your topology. It's replicated everywhere. It's highly available. You add new pools, you don't have to add subnets again, things like that. So we have something called a MAC resolver. Um, probably you're not going to be aware of what a MAC resolver is unless you go down that PDM path or the phone discovery manager path. Um, but what it does is it sends a request, which is the MAC address of the client. And that PDM will then take the MAC address and look in the database to find where it was discovered. Um, the, the PDM is going to respond with the switch IP and the port of the uh, port's MAC address that it was connected to. And then after all of that process happens, it sends it back to the location to the client. So when you look in your client, for those that have E911 deployed, you'll actually see your address information is fully populated. Um, I'm a very visual person, so I have screen caps in here to show that, so bear with. It's coming up in a bit. Okay. So in terms of, I mean, ultimately, a 911 call is just a voice call, right? But Link um, was developed in such a way as to provide um, a method of ensuring that it was treated differently from a, a other voice calls. And this is just a simple overview of the, the uh, voice routing within a, a Link environment and how um, numbers are normalized and processed and, and associated with PN, PSTN usages and, and then ultimately routed. As you'll see, the first thing that Link will actually do is determine whether the call is actually an emergency call. If it is an emergency call, processing, additional processing at that point stops. And we simply look for the first PSTN usage that matches 911 and um, routes the call um, through the gateway or you know, to the whatever. If you have a, like a 911 enable appliance, then obviously goes to that endpoint to the, um, uh, the 911 network on the PSTN. So we talked about the open interoperability program. Um, so there's two different categories. We have the service providers, so um, 911 enable, Entrado, and level three. So those are the IP trunks, the IP gateways that I'm going to hand that 911 call off, hopefully with accurate PID flow data in it, um, or the ELIN gateways, which Alan spoke to a little bit before. Again, I can't stress enough, please, 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 make sure the partner's on the open interoperability program website. That means we've worked with them. We've qualified them. We know they work, and they know how we work. Um, yes, I saw a hand. Uh, the last slide, you said that uh, as soon as somebody dials 911, it just decides it's an emergency call, and you don't have to worry about the PSTN directly. Can the call be bifurcated into two calls, uh, one to the internal security or uh, this, this short, guy gets the, short, the invisible Skype card I ran short, out of. Short answer is yes. Yes, and I will talk about it in 97 slides. <laughs> Kidding. That woman right there just packed her bag. She was like, I'm out. <laughs> Going to the, where those beers are they talk so, about. So we're, as Microsoft, we're really not supposed to recommend a partner, right? So, but the reality is that um, if, you, if you're thinking about 911 and uh -huh. implementing it, you need to be talking to 911 enable at some point, right? They need to be involved in the conversation. They've been with Link Since from the very beginning. beginning. Intrado is really very focused on carrier level, right? So even though they have a product, even though it's certified for Link, um, the reality is um, they're not focused on the enterprise, right? They're, they're, they're the carrier guys. Yeah. Yeah, and we will very cautiously dance the line of product recommendations, but. <laughs> No, talk to me. I, I don't dance that line. But, I don't uh, dance that I line. have multiple customers using them, and, and they're a great provider, and we, we'll talk a little bit about how they kind of work. Um, and not they being 911 enabled. He's like, oh, Jason's going to give a product demo. This should be interesting. Um, but we'll talk about going to the IP trunks of a 911 provider. So the scenario I'll use is 911 enabled since my Seattle customers use them. Um, but what happens is basically a SIP invite contains that 
um, user's location. So Jason Collier, 401 Fifth Avenue, Seattle, Washington, da 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 da. My caller's callback number. Um, and then what's called a notification URL, which is a super sexy feature of 911. So what's the worst thing the security desk hates? People call them, so my customer before Link has a sign, after you call 911, call the security desk. Sheesh, I'm having a heart attack. Oh God, I called 911, I better go call the security desk, tell them what to call 911. It's not gonna happen, right? That's not realistic. So we have this notification that can go out and you get an IM message that says 911 has been called. You can see if there's address information or manual, the SIP information. We also have that conference callback feature. So security would love to be on that call. Do you know why? I'm in the J, I'm back, there I go again. I'm in the clinic. Which clinic? I'm not sure, right? The 911 operator hates that. Now you put the security guy on the phone, he can listen. I have that option, one way, right? He can listen, or I can put it two way. And he can go, ma'am, he is in the public health clinic on the third floor of 401 Fifth Avenue. I know it because of the red carpets with the green blah, 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 blah. So great feature that Link has and can enable that nine, those 911 providers um, to do that. So the one thing I will call out that has been a fun challenge with this is these 911 calls route IP, right? So I have a customer who's routing to 911 enable through a set of checkpoint firewalls. And I get the call at 6 a.m. ish. Jason, the jail can't call 911. Sorry, the seventh floor of the jail can't call 911. So I go over there, bring my trusty phone, my link client, my laptop, and I plug my phone in. I can dial 911. I plug their phone in, can't dial 911. Back and forth, back and forth. Take the jail phone outside, plug it into my laptop, can't dial 911. What we found was the firewall vendor had decided to make a small change to their SIP processing rules and were blocking 911 calls if the common area phones had a hyphen in, them, in the name of them. The display name of, the, I didn't see where it came from, the common area phone had a hyphen. It looked at that and said, hey, it's probably a SIP exploit, let's just stop that 911 call. Um, so, and I called 911 able, and I said, hey, 911's broken. And they said, no, it's not. And I'm like, yes, it is. He's like, nope, check your stuff. So I called back, and I said, you were right. It was us. We were good. Um, so <laughs> be careful of those things. Um, those firewalls, can, if you've got them looking at that, be very careful. Know your call flows. Know where it's going. Um, okay. Did that you had, want to say something? Sorry. I, yeah, that had nothing to do with the slide. Yes, it did. <laughs> So, so let's move on. Oh, he's got the clicker. Yeah, I'm in control. <laughs> I don't have a mute button for him, but that's okay. Okay, so as you saw in the last slide, a lot of text. We'll not dwell on these slides. You know, you guys can you know have access to them when you when you're away from the conference. So um, we'll just we'll get to the interesting stuff, right? So we said link supports um, E91 via SIP trunk as well as via an ELIN gateway. Obviously. Um, you know, SIP is native to Link, and so that's, you know, that's generally the way that we see E911 implemented. But there's certainly, um, for example, um, analog phones in the Link environment or the Mac client, they don't support E91, right? The, the Link for Mac 2011 does not support uh, E911. So you have to accommodate those, for those deployment scenarios, and, you know, one of the ways that you can do that is, is via, you know, an ELIN implementation. Um, so, just something for you to think about. It had everything to do with this. <laughs> okay. So, um, location aware emergency routing. So, emergency calls can be routed to specific PSTN gateways based on the location policy. Obviously, we have dependencies on those subnets being populated. Um, network configuration is common for those local uh, policies. Um, whether you have CAC or call admission control in place and media, things like media bypass. So this becomes particularly important in a global deployment. You know, you don't want someone dialing, you know, 911 in Europe and uh, call failing, first of all, because you haven't put, input the mask for 911. Um, and, you know, obviously you need to translate that number to 112 in Europe or you know, 999 in the UK. Um, so this is really important, an important consideration if you have a highly mobile workforce. And, and so, once again, larger deployments, larger organizations, 
um, something, something important to think about. So can you give me a real world example of this, maybe your times in San Paulo? Yes, here's an example, Jason. <laughs> Remember uh, somebody modifying <laughs> slides. So <laughs> we like to base some of these, the, the presentation materials on our own experiences, and so um, that would be me in the slide there. So Alan and Matt want to go to Sao Paulo, but Alan and Matt get into trouble in Sao Paulo. How could you do that? I do not know. If there is a network um, location policy attached or associated with the Sao Paulo site, then I could dial 911 and still reach Brazilian emergency authorities. And so obviously, you know, in, a, in an emergency, and it's a life and death situation possibly, it, you don't want any delays, you don't want any problems, right? The call's got to work, the call's got to get through quickly, and more importantly, they've got to know how to get to you. And so the location-based emergency routing is, is, is a very important feature and, and certainly one that you should be aware of in your planning. I would say the other thing is to always pay your taxi driver properly. So. Okay, branch offices. You know, a lot of, a lot of organizations have a lot of sites. Um, a lot of those sites, particularly smaller sites, have bandwidth constraints. And we talk, uh, you, you hear a lot about call admission control within Link and how you plan uh, to ensure that um, you maximize the quality of a call at the same time as maximizing the number of calls that can be made over that link. The reality is that when you're talking about an emergency call, you must remember that in a bandwidth constrained environment, calls could fail, right? You know, we all like to think that we have well-run networks, at least the network guys tell us that they have well-run <laughs> networks. The reality is, is often very different. And so in a branch office situation, really, really seriously consider having egress to the PSTN from a local PSTN gateway for 911 calls. Um, if you're comfortable with routing 911 calls to a centralized location, you know, um, you'll go right ahead. But at the very least, have a backup route and ensure that that call will be completed every single time. No, you wouldn't necessarily lo use location-based routing. You'd probably just want to have a location policy for that site and a, a unique PSTN usage for that site, for those users in that site. Right. Yeah, I, I, personally, I'm a big believer in, in, in local PSTN egress for 911 calls. I, I just have no faith in, in WAN connections. And so, you know... It, 911 calls generally are too important to, to be trusting to, you know, a bandwidth constrained WAN. So here's a little bit. Um, it's the wrong image. Um, so the location required equals no. So you can see in the top one, it's a little bit smaller. Um, if the location equals yes, you can see there's a little exclamation point. I was trying to grab the laser pointer, but he didn't catch that. Um, so we have the exclamation point. And the little red X, right? So I can't dismiss this. So this is, you know, Alan alluded to it pretty bluntly. This is the legality, the lawsuits, right? Hey, I'm putting in here the disclaimer. If you don't put an address and you call 911, we're probably not going to know you're stuck in the Bellagio elevator, right? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you want to identify and populate your user location in the client. You're going to get a prompt to pop up. You're going to put your street address you know, information about where you're located. Um, so that location information will help that call route to the correct, sorry, emergency provider and help inform them of the location of the caller. Yes, sir. Correct. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So, there are some really powerful animations in this PowerPoint yeah, slide. Very. And took us a I did them all. Jason broke them. I fixed them. I did them all. I think there was a bug in PowerPoint. That's all it I'm was. saying. It was. So um, they get totally messed up. So um, we're going to talk about configuring E911 in Liz. So remember, I'm a visual person. If you put us a big bullet list, you're going to get mad at us, and you're going to give Alan a four and me a five, and so we want to avoid that. Yeah. 
So the first things we're going to do, we're going to engage with the need 911 service provider. Um, go down to the product showcase before you go to the party tonight so you're coherent on this. And find a vendor down there. Talk to them. Um, you're going to configure link. I thought your animation didn't work for a sec. Um, configure link. You're going to populate your Liz database with these network elements. He didn't, he caught it. It's going in the Liz database, imported into the CMS, replicated all the way around. And we're configuring our policies, routes, and we've got the users that that's configured with. Now, the gentleman in the rows is back there a few ways. Um, we have to test the addresses for validity. I have many customers that don't know their own addresses. And the format of their address can be a challenge. So you have something called the um, MSAG, Master Street Address Guide. Woo. Got it right there. Yeah, I, it was like MSG, it's bad for you. No, the Master Address Guide, um, what they do is they have a validation of the addresses. So I have a customer that has, in Seattle, we have 5th Avenue, 4th Avenue, 3rd Avenue. In the Master Address Guide, AV is AVE for 5th and 4th. For 3rd, it's Avenue. No idea why. So when we go to validate, it comes back and says, hey, this isn't a valid address. Here's what this is suggested for you. That's because that's what the PSAPs know and love. That's the format. Um, they're looking for. So high level configuration steps. We're creating a dedicated PSDN usage, as Alan talked about. Creating our voice routes, our location policies. Network information, put it in Liz. It's in the CMS. Um, so subnets, again, my favorite, Alan's favorite, easiest to define. Um, it's going to be a strong partnership with the network team, either at your company or if you're a consultant at your customers' companies. You guys were, you like the animations, right? So location discovery, we'll talk about this really briefly. Um, so the client is basically, I've authenticated my client, I've connected to link. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send my subnet information and I'm gonna send that to the registrar. Remember, registrar, front end, synonymous-ish in our world. So the registrar is gonna return the Liz URI and the location policy, and it does this during the in-band provisioning. So we all use Snooper, right? We've all looked in the client logs and we've seen the in-band provisioning settings. Um, so in this scenario, the subnet that I have passed to the Liz is in enabled for E911, um, which means it's been defined in link, it's properly defined, and has a location policy associated. So then the client sends the subnet to the Liz, um, so the locations by subnet. Um, so the registrar did this diagnose or did this interrogation, gave me the response. I publish it to the Liz, and then the Liz does that subnet match. And you've heard me drop this acronym a few times on PIDflow, and we get the PIDflow match back. So that's all cool and dandy. So now what happens is. You're doing a fine job. Keep I'm going. sorry. I told, so that slide said Alan's, so I kept going. So. <laughs> Jason wanted to talk about the pictures. I was going to do the grown-up stuff later, but okay. So, Tough yeah, crap. Come on. Should have got you a beer. Click so, hey, Alan, what would, it, what would happen <laughs> if we placed an emergency call? Can you walk me through that? Okay. So we're placing an emergency call, and the user's location is embedded in the PID flow, which is passed along the trunk to the gateway. If you have notification enabled for a security desk, they can either receive an IM, or if you have a third party, you could conference them in and have one-way, two-way audio. The call gets placed across the connectivity. We have a SIP trunk listed here. It doesn't have to be a SIP trunk, obviously. With service providers, you typically have multiple methods of connecting to um, their service. Um, so it could be a SIP trunk, it could be an MPLS connection, or it could just be, you know, true vibe over the internet. The service provider gets the call. If the, if the address is valid, which means it's been validated against MSAG, as Jason was talking about earlier, then the service provider is able to identify the correct PSAP, and the call is obviously delivered to the PSAP, and emergency services will um, respond uh, to the location. If the, if the address has not been validated, and for 
100% of your users that are working remotely and have typed in their address, it, it will not be validated. Um, they will generally hit your 911 service provider call center, who will attempt to identify the location from which the call is being placed, and they will pass, and from that information, they will identify the correct PSAP and uh, transfer the call to the PSAP in order to um, ensure that first responders you know, can um, handle the call. And hopefully, um, the hmm. person is saved. Yeah, and, and the, the other thing right there, you know, under step five, we have the voice path back. So as the gentleman over here asked, if we grab the security desk, the voice path is going to go back to include those fo folks in the conference call, so the security desk folks. So how does this all work, right? So that was the overview that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, right? Very high level. Um, there's a lot of material out on the web where you, that you can go download and, and get a good introduction to E911. This next section is where we get into some of the detail as to what Link is doing behind the scenes in order to make all of this work. So we've talked about it already, the Liz database, probably one of the simplest databases inside Link. This is not a complete set of the tables. Um, but it, are, it is the key tables, and, and they're very self-explanatory. It's not hard to identify where the subnet information is being stored when there's a table called subnet. Um, so what we have here is um, the relationship between those tables, and obviously the reason that's important is because when a client passes a, a subnet, as an example, there has to be a, a, a location associated with that subnet in order to um, populate the um, address for that particular so uh, when we use the set CS Liz subnet commandlet um, in the link server management shell, um, you'll actually see that it's actually calling this stored proc or the stored procedure in the SQL database cause Liz set called Liz set subnet location. Um, so this stored procedure is being called. It's executed on the central management stores backend SQL server. That's what's grabbing that data and adding it into the database. And then a process kicks off that then will inject that into the CMS through an XML data stream. Sorry, I didn't want to take your clicker duties. OK, so we've populated an address into the database. The next step is that we have to validate those addresses. The address validation process is something that you do uh, with your provider. So um, generally, they provide you with um, an address validation URL is typically a web service. All of the validation requests are generally authenticated, so they'll provide a client-side certificate. And the, the, the basic process is that, in this case, you'll see once again that we're using 911 enable here. Um, we do an HTTPS post to a specific URL that 911 enable host. And this is what you see in the post request. There's a couple of things of interest here. Can we go back now? Yeah. So the one thing that um, there's plenty of tech net or plenty of blog posts about trying to manually validate entries in the database. They don't do that. Not supported. Not the way to go. The other thing is, as Alan said about the certificate and the test um, or the test, the validation routine is profile specific. So if you have a tools server. Alan logs in, runs his PowerShell script, specifies certificate, specifies password to the certificate. Jason comes along, tries to run the command. It's not going to work if I'm logging in as my profile. So profile specific, um, we have had fun with that. Yeah, definitely don't change the address from, from validated um, or un invalidated to validated. That was a bug in, in 2010 where um, a, a, an address wouldn't be published if it had not been validated. That was fixed in CU1. Um, and so. A client will receive an address regardless of whether it's been validated or not. Um, all it will change is how that call is processed. So no need to be messing with SQL tables. The, the clients are going to get the address that you put in regardless of whether they're validated. All it will change is how that call is routed. Either it's going to go to your service provider's call center. They will try and determine the, the location in order to pass it to the correct PSAP. Or it will automatically route to the correct PSAP. OK, so back to the validation process. So this is the, the, this is the content of a, a post request. Obviously, it's SOAP XML, pretty read, readable. The thing of interest here is and highlighted in blue there, that, that Nina XML. 
What you'll notice is if you look at the body of the post request, you'll see the MSAG community. Now, um, that's obviously referring to the city, so that's different to how Microsoft stole the information and, and how you enter the information with a set CSLIS subnet command. But nonetheless, it's, it's part of a NINA standard. It's just something that um, uh, it's how the two systems, two different systems that were developed separately communicate with you. So, you know, nothing to be confused by. Um, it's just a different standard that's, that's being used in order to, to validate that particular address against the MSAG. It, and it's probably worth pointing out that you can run, we use Fiddler 2, just as a web debugging tool. Everybody tried Fiddler before. We'll capture all the web traffic. You can see this. This is all of these are straight from real 911 calls, which yeah, they didn't like us. Yeah, they eh. they're like, what are you doing? We're writing a presentation in Vegas, so uh, hey. So here's the here's here's the response, right? So the client, so you've, you've you've run the command, you're trying to validate the address. This is the response that you get from your service provider, and in this case, you can cl clearly clearly see that the address is valid, right? It's not it's not ambiguous in any way. And if it's not valid or if you're close, they will come back with suggestions on, hey, you put this, but do you mean this? So the, the common examples I would say are Avenue and Ave. Um, Seattle's huge with misspellings on city names or multiple cities with yeah. spaces, no spaces. The MSAG is very un unforgiving in terms of contractions for street names, drive, avenue, post direction, pre direction. So, you know. Um, that the, the, suggest, the suggestions that are returned are, are your friend. Yeah, and again, I said this jokingly, but a lot of customers will save their address to say 300 Northwest Fifth Ave, but it might be Northwest 300 Fifth Ave. So those are the challenges you'll run into with every new deployment. Exactly. In so, Seattle. Exactly, right. So we've seen what's happening in terms of the actual address validation process from a web services perspective, right? You're communicating with a service provider, they're validating the, the various components of the address and they're saying, yes, it's valid, no, it's not valid. Now, what's happening in the background after that process is complete is, once again, another stored procedure, right? And what it's doing this time is it's basically setting the MSAG valid attribute to one or zero. Obviously, one is valid, zero is not valid. So in this example, we see an address that is not valid. Once again, it would still be displayed on the client if... Um, you know, uh, the um, subnet or, or what, whatever network identifier was used uh, associated with this location. So when we publish the LIS or the Location Information Services configuration, um, again, everything we're doing, uh, stored procedures are being executed. Um, it's being executed on the central management store SQL server. Why is that important? I'm on the support side. If something's failing, I want to go look at logs, right? I'm always the data, data, data guy. I need to see what's failing. Um, so when I run this publish CS list configuration, um, it's running these commandlets or these stored procs. Um, interestingly enough, if you look in our code, the way it runs it is the same exact way when we publish topology in Topology Builder. Um, so it's kind of neat when you watch the XML data sets and debug and things like that. So. So what's actually happening is, right, so you're publishing, you've got all the addresses and, and network ident identifiers, all of the locations are associated with your network identifiers, and the next step is obviously you have to publish that information so that clients can actually receive the information when, when they're logging on and, and, and requesting their location. So at that point, what's actually happening is there is an, XM, an XML document is actually created, right? It's obviously created in memory, as, we, as you can see on the slide there. Um, and there's another store procedure um, called, which is called XDS query items. And what it's doing there is it's referencing the XML document uh, in order to populate it with the new data that you have just validated with your service provider. Yep. So basically we're taking your topology as it exists and inserting the new data in the same XML syntax, structure, and format. So obviously, next step is there's a series of store procedures in, that, that step through this process, and what we see here is the publish items. And if you look at the XML stream that's been encoded here towards the bottom, that, what that represents is actually that's a series, a single length of data that represents all of your network identifiers and all of your locations. Right? It's obviously en encoded, but it is stored as a single stream of um, uh, and, uh, encoded data in an XML document. 
So we can debug um, your location information services configuration. So again, link management shell is our friend. Um, I, can enter, I can issue the debug CS Liz location configuration. Um, Alan's nice. He formats and wraps the table, so it makes it a little easier to read. Uh, but this is, again, I want to see what's out there, what addresses are published. Um, I was like, wait a minute, why is my address in there? So, so the interesting thing is, yeah, these, these locations and these um, network identifiers you see, that's what's been encoded, and that's that, that, that's the location information settings XML stream right there. And obviously here you see the relationships between network identifiers, you see locations, you see subnets, and you see civic addresses, right? So that's how the, the relationships are maintained within that XML document. So we talked a little bit about earlier the in-band provisioning settings. Um, so how we get the settings or the values of the parameters down through in-band provisioning. This is the link client logging in. Um, so I can see the SIP 200 OK message um, or the um, IVP that I've gotten. So I can see emergency enhanced emergency services is enabled is set to true. Um, which PSTN usage is going to be used. Um, Alan and I are both fans of using very standard namings of emergency for PSTN <laughs> usages, but um, not always the case what we see. Um, what are the dial strings? So 911, um, and then the dial mask, right? So how many people here work at a company where you used to have to dial 9 to get an outside line? Yeah, so I've seen plenty of scenarios where people are calling 911 and they're so confused, it's like 9999911. They don't know how many 9s, right? It's a panic scenario. So these are the, make sure you're mapping dial plans when you replace the legacy PBXs. And that last item is particularly important. In Link 2010, you couldn't change that. It's a four-hour refresh interval on, on location. You can change it in, in Link 2013. It's a, it's a property of the um, location policy, but the, the, the smallest increment is one hour. Right, so what this is saying is if I don't identify a net that I've changed networks, this is how often I'm going out to query for information. Um, so this is very important when using something like maybe the PDM, things like that. Um, the one thing is, is that the link client will pick up you've changed networks and will query. Um, so the scenario I use, the elevators, when you change an access point, you obviously are changing to a new network entity. Did you have a question? No, I like the verb on the last PowerShell command through this slide. It's the debug. 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 That's actually the British way of saying debug. debug. Oh, hey, if we'd done the slides before we came to Las Vegas, we would have been in better shape. <laughs> They're pretty juicy. They? The free drinks? Ooh. Yeah. yeah, sitting in a bar, we're talking about in-band provisioning and PSAPs, and the bartender's like, are you guys OK? Yes. No, obviously the answer was no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, apart from the fact that we work, well, we work for Microsoft, right? So um, web services for support, E911 support. Um, so the whole basis of this is a web service. Um, there's a WSDL or the web services document language, which is defining the structure of the schema out there. Um, so basically, it's a request and response kind of methodology. So it defines that structure, what elements or nodes in an XML um, SOAP request should exist. Um, we use that to, base, to retrieve the locations based on your network identifiers. So you know, Alan's on the subnet, you know, 10.10.10.1. I know he's in Raleigh, and he's dialing 911. Okay, so we've talked about identifying your locations, creating your network identifiers. We've gone through the process of how that data gets put into the, imported into the LIS database, how that data is then published into the XDS database which is obviously part of the CMS replication, right? So that's how the data gets from, L from the Liz database and it's replicated out to your entire infrastructure. This next section is, a, is, is from the, the perspective of the client, right? What's happening when the client is attempting to request an address? And as Jason just described, we have this um, 911 protocol. It's a Microsoft um, specification. It's, it's a public document. Um, and obviously that's, as we've alluded to, you know, the, the the folks that work with us in, through the open interoperability program you know, have access to this document and, and that's how we standardize you know, interfaces and ensure that you know, all of these parts, moving parts, work quite smoothly together. So, go ahead. Sorry. 
Go ahead. And, and that web service, is this what you're going to say? Possibly. It, it, it is, possibly. It was. It definitely was. So that web service is on the internal website, so that's from the internal network. Um, and that URL is passed during the in-band provisioning. That's correct. Line. So what you see here is a snooper trace, okay? He's modest, isn't he? So, so um, obviously, we turn on OCS logging. We uh, check the box for location information services. And this is what you see in the trace, right? This is a client, obviously me in this particular case, although that's not my right SIP address. Um, he doesn't want you guys to know it. It's Alan Mad. I've got disposable SIP addresses, so that's OK. Um, and in this case, you can see that I'm actually passing a MAC address, I'm, I'm passing a subnet, and I'm passing um, an IP, right? And so that's the basic format of a, loc a client location request. So the response that we're going to get, again, is XML-based. Um, so fairly simplistic to read through. Um, we can go from the top down um, if I had a pointer. Um, so A1 is address 1, which is our state. So in this case, Washington, I can see we're at Redmond. Um, the address would be 1, so HNO, house number. 1, Microsoft Way, the road. And then the ro location, you know, Redmond, and the name Microsoft Corporation, and then the zip. Something, something worth noting here is that if you deploy an ELIN solution with Link, this, this field here, this name field here, is used to store the actual number that we're using for ELIN, right? So with ELIN, you're going you're gonna to specify a, telef a unique telephone number. That telephone number is going to be statically mapped to an address. And uh, this is the field in which you would write that um, ELIN, uh, or store that ELIN number in order to allow the PSLE database to make a, a match the address that you uh, are trying to pass to the client. Now, this is a, this 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 is a um, this is an IE, IETF standard. These this XML format here, the Civic Address List format, and so these fields are standardized. And so A1 here is actually you know obviously in the states we see Washington for the state. It's actually just you know um, it's it's state. any division of whatever you know the country. So in in um, the UK, for example, it would be. Um, not in the UK, counties. <laughs> in Canada, it would be provinces. See, I was Canadian last night. So, or prefecture, so state, That's region, right. exactly prefecture. Right. Um, and then PRD is the leading direction. So if I'm on east, one Microsoft way. Um, so, and then RD is the primary road, things like that. So, um, For those that want to geek out on it, it's RFC 5139. If, yes. if that's your, your way of poison, is to download RFCs and read them on the plane. Don't judge me who giggled over there. So this is a response to an address request. But as you can see, it's actually showing you a scenario where there isn't a valid um, location to pass to the client. And obviously, it's the ubiqu ubiquitous 404, right, not found. <laughs> and what's interesting is we, we talked about this earlier with when we showed you a couple of screenshots of the client, right? Um, the method is being set to manual. And so that, what that means is the, the client, the user, will have to manually enter their address. Now, obviously, as I said before, they will never get it right, right? There's just so many contractions within the MSAG that, you know, no matter how carefully they enter the data or the, or the fact that they think they're doing it right, it, it, it will never meet the requirements of, of, of MSAG. And so in this scenario, what would happen is if this user was to, to make an, a 911 call, uh, the call would be routed to your service provider's um, emergency response center. And it, as I said, we've talked about it a couple of times already. It's, it's their responsibility to um, try and identify the location in order to get uh, the, callee in touch with, uh, the caller in touch with the right uh, the PSAP. Now, your service provider is going to charge you an arm and a leg for that call, right? So <laughs> they're, they're expensive, right? So you want to make, when you're implementing 911, you want to make sure that your uh, that your uh, addresses and, and network identifiers are accurate so that you minimize the, the charges that you get from you know, 911 calls that um, don't have a valid address. Sorry? Yes. So, so, and not for, so what I would say is, and I, I'm probably in the 400, 500 range of 911 calls in a year. Um, you can call and you just tell them, you know, standard verbatim, Hey, I'm Jason with Microsoft. I'm validating a VoIP deployment. 
this is a non-emergency, can you tell me my, your address? And you could say, is this my provider or the PSAP? And that's hugely important to test because I would say most of the field calls I go on, the customers not tested it and they don't know it's not working right. So, yeah. you know, yes, there's a pretty penny, but lives are... Yeah, I mean, just, that's a very good point that Jason's made there. You know, it's, it's critical that you two, test... Two so far, you said this. Two, yeah, you're on a roll. So it, it is important to test 911 calls, right? And, and some, some PSAPs are okay with you making unscheduled calls. Some PSAPs prefer that you schedule a call. And so just reach out to your PSAP, right? It's, it's, they're very responsive. They understand the realities of, of telephony and, and the requirements of, around E911. So if they require, reach out to them, talk to them, understand what their requirements are. If they require you to schedule a call, just to schedule a call, right? It just makes it easier on everybody. They don't have to worry about callbacks in case the, you know, the, the location or the, the, the number wasn't passed to them. So um, very important to test. Yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The caller bypass, I'm a network guy, forgive me, don't stone me. If I have a nicely summarized network, caller bypass gets broken unless I enter all those subnet IDs for caller bypass. What's that implication when it comes to 911? Can it handle route summarizing? No. Okay, so I'm still entering all of them. Yeah, so, so actually, Jason alluded this to uh, this earlier. That's the whole concept of. That's three. three. Wow. <laughs> You're going for a five. <laughs> five, baby. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That 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 has an impact, right? And and so you just there there are the in that type of scenario, the the solution that we most often see is is phone discovery manager, right? Where yep. you use the client MAC address, which is associated with a switch and pull, which is associated with the location, right? Okay, I wasn't for sure if I asked my question right. So if I have like one subnet for for residents that has seventy subnets in it, right? But I No. No. Right. Yeah. Which, hey, <laughs> where do you work? No. Um, which is common, right? You know, and I've had this argument. Your subnet is not there. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. So we're going to talk about it in about 10 slides, I think. We'll show you a link, little management, link, server management shell, synthetic transaction to validate it. Now, I'm not saying I've done this script and telling you to email me. But hey, it would be cool if I could take a whole list of subnets and just run them through that thing repeatedly, just to validate, right? Because you're a network guy and you've got all your subnets fully documented. I'm sure they're great. Yeah, they're perfect. They're awesome. This guy. <laughs> it, in the back of yes, in the back of the room, sir. Yeah. So. Even worse. Yeah. <laughs> Even worse. Okay. Network guys, leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> Except for network. No. And, and we don't judge network guys and gals. So, No, I, again, I think the phone discovery manager is going to yeah. be your only solution for that. Um, if you don't have the uniqueness of subnets to those you know, floors, corners of the floors, yeah. you know, this convention center is a good example, or sorry, this casino is a good example of that, you know. They, if they can't get a subnet that's not this whole entire pavilion promenade, I'm going to be able to speak shortly, <laughs> then they're going to be using something like the PDM device if they were a link VoIP deployment. So. You need to let the phone discovery manager know this switch port is in this location. Go get me the MAC addresses of those phones connected to this port. It, it gets ugly quickly. It really does. Yeah. It's... it's if, as, well, as Jason and I have, have said a couple of times now, if you can't get do subnets, then it starts to get really, really ugly. So just account for that if you've got a, well, yeah, from, from your deployment scheduling perspective, right? You know, you can't really deploy voice without 911 services, right? So and sometimes it can just take a long time to really correctly map switches and ports to specific locations, particularly, as Jason said, large campus environment, multi-level building, you know, that, you, that you've got, you know, two quadrants, or four quadrants, or two halves, right? So account for that, certainly. It, <laughs> but, but we, but we, oh, where's my badge? But Link loves you. I have the Link love name tag, so we're good.
Right. It yeah. has to be. It, it, it's. Right. It, it, it's like Alan and I's relationship, right? We have to like each other. We got to work together. <laughs> we may not get along yeah. very well, but not, we're going to work together. Not sure about that. Yeah. So what on the like part? <laughs> yeah, that's oh, right. So, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It has to be a partnership. Network has to be brought to the table. And the one thing customers, my, I don't, I'm not calling out anybody, but customers always seem to forget to bring networks to the table. Yeah. But you're the vessel. You're the train tracks. You need to be there first. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. Which is, you know, we'll call it. It is sucks, but you know that's what's going to make a successful deployment. W were we on the slide? Okay, so this is actual a SIP trace from a 911 call. As you can see, pretty self-explanatory. We see the invite going out to 911. Um, what's interesting here is in this bottom part, we see the PID flow, right? So we've got the content type of application uh, PID flow XML. So that's an indication that the um, uh, the that you've actually enabled PID flow on the trunk, which is one of the configuration steps that you need to do. I was going to say that is probably the most common 911 issue I've seen. Is a dispatch we'll get dispatched to customers. Hey, 911 is not working properly. You go in, you just check the checkbox on the trunk to enable PID flow, and then get back on the plane. And here is you know we we saw this something very similar earlier, right? This is this is just the location. Yep. So again, you're looking at that SIP messages. Um, again, OCS logger is your friend. We're going to talk about it here in a couple slides. Um, I'll own in the I'll own the mistake here in a second, but no. Um, so we talked secondary location services. Um, so we talked about the MAC resolver from 911 enable. Um, we do this. We set up this application using the set CS web service configuration commandlet. And so basically, we're saying use this URL to query an external application to match the MAC address. So my client's going to specify my MAC address, go out to the web services, post that out there, and return that. Um, so if location information is returned by the web service, the location information database is queried again with the information provided. Um, you strangely enough see that we like the phone discovery manager. Yes, we do. So the orders are important. So the location search order, we have it listed here. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is obviously the native link location information um, server, or LIS. The next is the MAC resolver. MAC resolver is typically somebody like 911 enable with their PDM or some other provider out there. Um, and then the third would be a secondary location source URL that we want to go ahead and search against. So at the bottom there, we see another snooper trace. And then you can actually see the Secondary location source URL is being specified, and you can actually just see the, the entire um, query string there. Yeah. And again, internal web services only, in band provisioning. Wait, yep. Why is this blank? So say that again. What's the scenario? Right. Right. That's right. Okay. So the, obviously the route is going to be determined by PSN usages and, and routes, right? So that's that's po po possibly the location-based routing that we talked about, right? And this is really a public scenario in this case, right? So that's not going to really apply. So you're gonna, you're going to get your whatever. Voice policy has been assigned to you, PSN usage is route. Call's going to go out. You're not going to have a validated address, right? So you will hit your 911 service provider's emergency call center. They will pick up and they will say, Where are you? Where are you, Bob? Right? And they'll try and ascertain the location. As soon as they've ascertained the location, they will connect you to the correct PSAP. In this case, it would be Clark County, right? Um, I don't know how many PSAP zones they have in Clark County, but um, I'm betting there's a one dedicated to the strip. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. What's really fun is in my scenario, my calls can go out to California. Right? It's going to hit PSAP near the trunk. Um, and that's what you want to necessarily like globally. Right. But if you ha
Right. So if you, in our scenario, if you have a provider out there, it's going to route to their call center, which, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, you're in Canada? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so. Actually, we do get the, uh, if they enter your location information, uh, as remote users, the call center will get the. Uh, they'll get that info there, put it in the bid flow, right? Yeah, and they'll just, yeah, for the bid flow, and they'll just confirm that that's what they want. Yeah, and. And they, and they won't, they actually won't get charged for that. Only if they have a notification. Allen's is a cheap one, not me. <sighs> yeah, definitely. Right. Right. Oh, you and me both. both. Yep. Um, yeah, and so really that that operator is the life-saving kind of element of that to get you to, you know, hey, I'm in front of the Bellagio, Alan pushed me in the fountain. <laughs> I'm drowning. Save me. No, that was Saturday night? Yeah, Saturday night. Saturday night. Um, so in this example, um, link server management shell, I think this was the network gentleman in the back that we all love network guys. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's going to be my number, the ones, all ones. So um, test CS Liz configuration, hugely important, right? So Jason's lazy. I just call 911, right? I'm like... That's faster than typing the command out. But I can script this. I can pump my list of all the subnets that my vendor knows that they, or my customer knows they have. I can run that through. I can test it. I can specify a SIP address. Um, anybody know when I don't need to specify the SIP address? If I've got my synthetic transaction test accounts created under health configuration. So. Uh, most customers forget to set up the health configuration and the synthetic transactions. Please do it. It's your friend. It will tell you when things are broken. So everybody know, anybody centralized logging service, who loves it? Great new feature of Link Server 2013. Give you the 30 seconds on it, right, before Alan clicks the next button. <laughs> so we have scenarios, right? You go and you say, I'm troubleshooting I am in presence. You start a scenario called I am in presence. You don't have to remember all those little different options we tell you in support. Hey, check uh, SIP stack, S4. Oh, give me a data MCU, and I'll take a, um, this to parlay it for 17 flat. Um, so where do we have a gap in 2013? There's no scenario for location information <coughs> services. Now, isn't that an oversight? Yeah, because they didn't get Alan and Jason. They That's like that. right. Huh. We'll be available on the strip later. We do take tips. So our gift to you for in return of the fives, you can actually create your own scenario. Um, and we did give you the commands here. Um, so where I have the tag here for level verbose, do not use all. So we have some a little, wonk, it's a little wonky right now where if you create your own custom scenarios and you use all, sometimes it doesn't capture data. We've made some improvements, we've made some improvements, we've made some improvements. Just use verbose. It's pretty much going to be the same amount of data. Um, the one thing that I would say everybody does is they issue these first two lines, and then they go, okay, let me try to start the scenario, and it fails. You've got to close the link management shell session, relaunch it, reinstantiate it. So this scenario, I called it LIS, L-I-S. I could have called it the full out location information services. Um, you know, if I wanted to be tricky, I could call the scenario 911, whatever. But now I have that centralized logging scenario available in Link Server 2013. And I could modify the always on scenario and add it to that as well. So this is our old friend from 2010, 2007, and back. Yeah, I saw a few people just went, oh. So when you're firing up this guy, you're usually having a bad day. So in here, we have location information services, which through the beauty of my screen cap is not displayed. But we're going to, anytime we troubleshoot LIS, you're probably going to troubleshoot, you're going to have Liz check, location information services, and SIP stack. Um, I tried the pointer again. So <laughs> in the middle, under level, always do all and all flags. Um, I don't think I've ever not done that. Um, support will pretty much usually ask for that. So don't forget, obviously, a 911 call, right? You've only got two elements that you're really going to be troubleshooting, right? Basically, it's a voice call, right? So you're going to follow your standard voice troubleshooting processes. And the other element is the, is the, the, the location, right? So it's a little bit different, nothing overly complicated. The, um, 
the, the output that you get from CLS or, or OCS logger, particularly around location, is, is very straightforward, very readable. Uh, doesn't take any experience to read it. So that will be the, the easiest part of the troubleshooting process. Obviously, voice is voice, right? It can, can get pretty complex. So um, unfortunately, a 911 call is pretty important. So you know, generally, if you're having problems, um, somebody's going to be breathing down your neck. So, oh, or not. <laughs> that was good. Very good. He said, or okay. not. <laughs> you, you can, he got me. Yeah, you should have a little. Well, you can have, a, you can have half a cup of cold coffee as a prize, if you like. Yeah, so um, we'll talk the user experience. Um, so here you can see my, I've been prompted for the disclaimer. I've clicked the button, so this is the disclaimer that says, um, Jason, you don't put in your address, you're going to have a bad time. So um, that's the experience. Um, the gentleman over here, he asked about the notifications to the security desk. Um, so this was me calling 911 Monday to screen cap it. Um, and obviously, we did not have an address populated because we were in the Bellagio, I think, at the time. So um, that went to manual and went to Canada. This is the other side of the equation. So this is a trivia question. So here is a properly formatted and validated address. This is the security notification I got, but it still says manual. Can anybody think, and this is a really wonky scenario where this happens. Anyone think of why I would go manual, even though it's a validated address, with a validated subnet? I, I obfuscated his name. <laughs> um, nope. This user was RDP'd into their workstation. So Link knows, hey, Yahoo's connecting from a different machine. He's not at this desktop. So it knows to put it manual. Isn't that sexy? I wrote that. <laughs> it would be funny if I. <laughs> so um, again, so that's just another validation. Um, had that not been through an RDP session, not been us dialing 911 on the customer's uh, infrastructure, um, that would have said automatic, would have gone straight to the PSAP in Seattle, and they would have responded in a hugely timely manner. So is that implications for VDI? Not VDI. So this is doing the. <laughs> He's Joe user at home, VDP, RDP, straight to his machine. So does the, does the VDI portion function with LIS? No. I mean, typically you've got a centralized VDI infrastructure, right? It's, it's hosted at your data center. Your user could be anywhere. That's the whole point of a VDI infrastructure, right? So, yeah. Yeah, the VDI plugin. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, but how are you going to validate the subnet of, of, a, of a personal WAP or something like that, right? I mean, yeah. I, th I, th I think so. Will you stop clicking? I didn't touch it, honest. Okay, so this concludes the session.